Revelation chapter 14 tonight. Hey, media team, you have both those graphics ready? Okay, you can go ahead and put the timeline, the graphical timeline up, and then we'll do the next slide after that. Revelation 14. Been a, a minute, been about uh, four or five weeks since we've looked at this book. Uh, together just due to sun, uh, Sunday night services in December and Christmas programs and all those wonderful things that happened in the month of December. And so just to get us back to what we need to understand, this is kind of an overview picture on the screen behind me of a timeline of Revelation. And so some of these things have already occurred. Some of the, I'll show you, um, remind you of the kind of the inspired outline of the book of Revelation in the next slide, but for just a, a moment, look at this one. And uh, what, where we are at right now in Revelation 14 places us towards the end of the section of Revelation that makes up uh, the tri uh, details about the tribulation. Uh, the balcony is going dark. They all, wake up, wake up. <laughs> yeah, we're still having church. Yeah, rapture didn't, didn't occur. We're all still here. Um, Revelation 14 is uh, kind of, uh, and I'll explain this when we uh, read the text and begin, but it's kind of like a, a pause in the action. Uh, not, not much advances chronologically in the five verses we will read tonight, but there's just little vignettes, little snapshots of what the tribulation is like. And then in Revelation 19, Jesus Christ comes again. He returns. And then Revelation 20 and on, you can see on the, on the screen there. But that's where we are we are at, and we've been enjoying this this book, and 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 sometimes not enjoying this book because of the news that we're receiving and the things we're understanding. But but overall, this is a book, church, that that uh, will give us stability in an unstable world. It will give us clarity in a, in a confusing world. This is a book that is intended by God to be read and to be heard and to be understood. And the Bible, in fact, promises a blessing to those who read and heed and understand the book of Revelation. Uh, this book will, will comfort you that when it seems like this world is out of control, that there is one who is in control, and that is God. Uh, at the same time we began Revelation, we were also kind of finishing up the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we saw all these instances uh, and, and these prophetic things dovetailing, but there's this other aspect of the sovereignty of God and the control of God that Daniel was not in control. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was not in control. The Babylon, Babylonians and the Medes and Persians were not in control. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not in control. President Biden is not in control. The, the leaders uh, fighting each other over in Israel and the Ukraine and the Russia war, those people are not in control. God is ultimately in control. And the, the events that unfold in the description of these things in the book of Revelation give us great comfort, uh, and they help us realize that, that God is, is right on schedule, that this world is proceeding just as God wills and just as God wants it to. And uh, this book will also, understanding this timeline and how these events unfold, will also help us live pure. There is a, 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 an aspect of prophecy that ought to motivate us to live godly. It ought to motivate us to live pure, purely. Prophecy has a purifying effect. If you're a believer, this book should motivate you to live purely. If you're not a believer, this book should scare you into accepting Christ as your Savior. Uh, the theme of Revelation is not hard to decipher. God wants his children, God wants his churches to know that he is sovereign over everything, past, present, and future, and everything that is promised in his word, he will literally fulfill everything concerning Israel, everything concerning the nations, everything concerning the church, everything concerning Satan and sin and judgment and his son Jesus Christ ruling and reigning victoriously. All these things will come literally true. You should have said amen. Thank you both of you for saying amen. I'm glad you're excited about the Bible. Um, so what we find here in Revelation 14 uh, is uh, a small part of the inspired outline of the book. Can I have the next slide, please? In Revelation 1.19, we have kind of the book gives us its own outline, and we've, this is where we've been the last uh, several months. Chapter 1 is writing about, uh, John was commanded to write about those things which he had seen, the past, and he writes about his visions of the glorified Christ, and then chapters two and three, we skipped for this particular series because we, uh, they don't really apply. They're kind of a, a church age study, the seven churches, the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And then uh, the next uh, rest of the book, chapters four through 22, is John is commanded to write the things which shall be hereafter. And you can look at those five sub points and see that we are uh, right there still in letter B. Uh, so as far as I can tell, we have about eight sermons, maybe nine left. 
uh, in the book of Revelation to finish us off. Uh, so let's begin in, uh, tonight in Revelation 14, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 5 tonight. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the, on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The title tonight is Marching to Zion. Marching to Zion. I pray once again, Father, thank you for our open Bibles. We pray that we'll also have open hearts and open minds and that we will continue to understand the timeline, the, the progression of events, and the things that are uh, written here for our encouragement and our edification. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there, um, in the world of sports, uh, timeouts are some of a coach's or a team's greatest tools. Uh, a, a coach could, could, at a crucial point towards the end of a game or towards when he dis discerns that this is a crucial play in the game, he'll call a timeout and gather his team on the sidelines. He'll give them some, some instructions. He'll draw up a play. And it can be very important for that team to have that timeout and regather their thoughts and regather their energy and their focus and go out there on the field. Now, sometimes it doesn't work out, as in the case of Alabama a few weeks ago, uh, when three timeouts were called and when they came back to the field on fourth and goal, they ran the dumbest play I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> After three timeouts, that's what they came up with. And, uh, and so it's important that all of you Tennessee fans hear me. I am critical of my own team at times, and uh, uh, you should be too. Uh, of your Tennessee team, because no, teams are, was I not clear about that? I'm so sorry. Um, I need to move on. I shouldn't do that. I can just, I sense the Holy Spirit leaving the room whenever I talk about Tennessee football, and, um, and I, I, I should learn my lesson. After four years, I should know my lesson. So Tennessee's great. I, I love it. I love Tennessee. It's a volunteer state, and they can't make me live here, but I do. I choose to live here. Um, so, all right. So often, here we go. A coach will call a timeout just to get the team's head in the game. Uh, and since we have embarked on a, a journey of revelation, we have seen uh, just turmoil and catastrophe and uh, death and destruction. And in chapter 14, we're pretty much at the midpoint of the tribulation. We need a timeout. As I said, there are several snapshots in chapter 12, 13, and 14 that don't really advance the chronology of the timeline at all. They do give us kind of an overview of what's happening kind of behind the scenes or on the front stage. And so we, we, the idea is that uh, scholars believe that, that John here is writing these visions down. He's getting these visions. He's writing them down. And under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he determines and God determines that maybe we need something to encourage us at this point. We need something, and what we see here is a vision of mercy and a vision of hope in the midst of the, the wrath of God being poured out on the earth uh, during these, uh, this midpoint of the tribulation. So these first five verses update us on the mission of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists that we met back in chapter 7. And uh, they've been, uh, these redeemed, uh, preserved, protected, sealed Jewish evangelists have been preaching the word of God. They've been teaching unharmed around the world during the tribulation. And this is kind of a final summary of their ministry. And we can draw some applications, which we will do tonight. So five points, or four points rather, just to walk us through what's happening here. Number one is the setting the setting, what, what's, what's happening, what's going on in this vision. So John sees in a vision, by the end of their ministry, by the end of the ministry of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, he sees them gathered with Jesus Christ 
on Mount Zion. They're gathered from the four winds of the earth, from the four corners of the earth where they have been ministering for the last seven years, for the, for the seven years of the tribulation. And they have gathered from all the, the ends of the globe to stand with Christ on Mount Zion. Now, uh, scholars are divided over whether this is a vision that happens in heaven, a vision of heaven, or a vision of earth. Uh, Zion is often used to refer to heaven, the heavenly city. Uh, so the question is, is this a vision that John is seeing that pertains to earth, or is this a vision that John sees that pertains to heaven? My personal opinion, really the majority opinion, would be that this is a vision that is happening of something that John sees will happen on the earth. A, um, verse 2 tells us that they hear, he hears a, some sounds from heaven. So the idea logically is that he's in one place standing and he's hearing something from another place. So I don't think the Bible would tell us he heard a voice from heaven if the vision takes place in heaven. So this is all part of the, the regathering of the Jewish people to their Messiah. This is part of the regathering of Israel from the ends of the earth. This verse also verifies for us as, as this vision fast forwards us towards the end of the tribulation. Stay with me, please. This vision uh, fast is, is a prevision of what's going to happen in about three and a half years from the point that John's at in, in, in this understanding of the timeline. And he's seeing the end of the tribulation, the end of the battle of Armageddon, and he sees this, this victorious group of evangelists standing safely, standing healthy with Jesus Christ on Mount Zion. And I do believe it's a literal place. Uh, there's 160 times in the Bible that Mount Zion refers to literal Jerusalem. 160 times, there's about two times it refers to a spiritual dimension of Jerusalem or a spiritual heaven. But 160 times in the Bible, almost nearly 99% of the times that Zion is used in Scripture, it's referring to the literal city or area of the Holy Land in Jerusalem. This is a preview of what will happen in Revelation 19 when Jesus returns. And it lets us know that the prophecies of the minor prophets, prophecies like Zechariah 14.4, where, that predict that Jesus Christ, go back there, let's turn back there. We need to turn back there and see this. So go back to one of the last books of the Old Testament in Zechariah, Zechariah 14 and verse 4, and we'll see uh, this reference to Mount Zion. Are you there? Say, got it. All right, if you need more time, say, oh me. All right, you're working on it. Revelation 4, uh, Zechariah 14, 4, it says, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. This image that John sees in Revelation 14 affirms the vision of Zechariah 14 of Jesus Christ standing, returning to the earth on Mount Zion. This, this verse in Zechariah specifically identifies the place where Jesus Christ will place his feet, where his literal feet will place down in a literal earth at the end of the battle of Armageddon. And when his feet touch this mount, when, the, when his feet touch this location, the, the ground will shake. The stones will break. The mountain will split apart. And so John is seeing in this vision, he's seeing these men, these 144,000 men with Christ gathered in this return, gathered victoriously, they're on earth, and this appearance of the Lamb, I, I love the fact that twice, at least twice in these five verses, Jesus Christ is again referred to as the Lamb. Nowhere else in the scripture other than the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ referred to more than the Lamb. There is a Lamb that was slain. His blood was spilt. His body was tortured and bruised and, 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 and uh, scarred for our iniquities. And that lamb is the lamb of God. This, this of course, comes from that image that, that, that sin demands a sacrifice. Sin demands blood to be shed. And, and sin demands a, a spotless lamb. And all those things pointed to in shadow, pointed to Jesus Christ. He's described here victoriously. They're rejoicing in their salvation. They're rejoicing in the gospel. They're rejoicing in the, uh, the grace of God through the lamb of God. And so, as John sees in this vision, the setting is that he sees these, these uh, still living, still serving, still safe, 
still preaching 144,000 Jewish evangelists. They're standing together with Christ on Mount Zion, a place of worship east of Jerusalem. It is here that he gathers them. It is here that he begins to gather uh, his uh, uh, people, people Israel together as well as prepare for the earthly 1,000-year reign. So back in Revelation 14, you can go back there if you'd like. We see first the setting, and then uh, secondly, we see the singers. In uh, Revelation 7, we learn the identity of these Jewish evangelists. They, they are selected. They are sealed. There is a protective seal of God on their foreheads. They cannot be harmed. They are servants. They go wherever they are living. They, are, they serve as evangelists. They serve as proclaimers of the gospel. And in, this is in the midst of the tribulation. They are, are scattered. So these sealed, these selected, sealed serving men are scattered all across the globe preaching the gospel. Scores and scores and scores are being saved. We also see here that they are singing men. They are they're singers. That's point number two. They have um, God's seal upon them, which let me point out a couple of things about them. There are some things that are true about these 144,000 evangelists that are also applicable to us today. I believe this will be on the screen. They are divinely protected. These men are divinely protected. Think of it, please. These men, in the midst of all this, these catastrophes of the tribulation, these men are literally God's untouchables. They cannot be killed. They cannot be destroyed. They have literally witnessed and served God unharmed. Millions. It, it's, it's beyond uh, our minds to fathom the scope of the catastrophes. Millions will die. Millions close to billions will die during the tribulation, and yet these men have been unstoppable. They made it. I like what John, uh, John Phillips is a great commentary writer. Here's a long quote. I want to read it to you. He said, I love what John Phillips said. Quote, no other age has produced a company like this, a veritable army of believers marching unscathed through every form of danger. It has been theirs to defy the dragon, to bait the beast. Their calling has been to preach the gospel from the housetops, when even to name the name of Christ called for the most dreadful of penalties. They have been able to laugh to scorn all the grand inquisitors of hell, they have walked the streets in broad daylight, careless of the teeth-gnashing rage of their would-be assassins, true witnesses in the most terrible era of the history of mankind. The devil knows about this coming band of conquerors, and he writhes already in agony of anticipation. They've been faithful. They've been divinely protected. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against the people of God shall prosper. That's not to mean that physical harm won't happen to us, but won't, we won't be ultimately destroyed. May I encourage you in something? I don't know what the date of your death or my death is, but we are divinely protected until God is done with us. We are divinely sealed. We, we are invincible. We are unstoppable until our work that God has for us is done on this earth. As long as you are alive, there is hope. As long as you are alive, God has a plan for you. As long as you are alive, you are safe. As long as you are in the will of God, you are safe. You are invincible until that plan for your life and the days of your life are numbered. Until those numbers come up and your time is done, you need, until then, you need not fear Satan. You need not fear any man. If these evangelists can minister faithfully in their environment, in their era, in the worst age, the most terrible era in all of human history, then we can be witnesses today. We, 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 we don't face the threats. We don't face the danger. We don't face the persecution that they uh, will be witnessing when it's uh, happening, what, the, what surrounds them. And so Satan can do nothing to them. Satan can do nothing to us without divine permission. You're invincible as long as God has a purpose for you on this earth. We see in letter B that these uh, singers, these men, they are divinely preserved. Would you think of this? The Bible tells us that not one of them is lost. It's not 143,999. It's 144,000. 
And I'm suggesting to you by way of application, kind of bringing this text up to our church age in our lives as believers, that in this preservation of the evangelists, we see a picture of the preservation of the Christian life, of our eternal security. We find a picture of the eternal security of the believer. And I know we call it in theological terms the preservation of the saints, but I would just hasten to tell you it's not so much the preservation of us as saints, it's the preservation of the Savior. It's his work. I love that old hymn. I think I, I, I quote this every time we talk about this subject. That old hymn that says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You see, when you got saved, uh, you did the committing. And when, once you do the committing, Jesus Christ does the keeping. And, and the uh, book of John uh, stresses for us that once we are in the Father's hand, no man is able to pluck us out of our Father's hand. So these evangelists are divinely protected. They are divinely preserved. We see in that a picture of our salvation that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I do the committing and Jesus does the keeping. The point is this, that all who truly get saved totally stay saved and totally go home to heaven. We don't believe here. We don't believe the Bible teaches in any way, shape, or form that you can lose your salvation. You can't lose it. What did you do to get your salvation? Nothing. What do you do to keep your salvation? Nothing. You, it's, an, it's all of grace. Uh, it's all of grace. There's, there, that's a point of encouragement, my friends. That's a point of encouragement for all of us, every Christian and every generation. We have been sealed by the Spirit of God, and He will not lose one of us. He won't lose a one of us. All of us who are saved will stand one day with the Lamb like these men. Let's talk about the song. This is just a, such a different passage, a different thing, uh, and some things are drawn out here that we didn't expect to find, perhaps, in the book of Revelation. The song. The song. Please take note, and let's talk about singing. Let's talk about music in the church for just a moment. I'm not going to be um, preferential. I'm not going to talk about, you know, styles and preferences and tastes of music necessarily. But when you think with me about the importance of music in a church, you ever, you ever just, um, uh, we're singing this morning, right? I'm, I'm down here, I, I have such a, I hear the piano, I can, I can hear the choir so good, and I can hear you sing so well. It's, it's, this is the spot, this is the blessing spot right down here where I stand. I get to hear you sing. I just, sometimes I just, I mouth, I move my lip, I'm not singing, I'm just listening. Do you ever wonder, do you ever just kind of look and think about, here we are, hundreds of us, all looking at that guy, Singing. What are we doing? You ever, you ever wonder about, it, it, it might seem somewhat ridiculous to you, like, what are we doing? Why are we just, I drove here for this? We're, we're, we're just, this guy picks the songs and we get to sing them? You ever wonder about the significance of this? Uh, of what we really are doing this for? Why, why is music, why do we even have music a part of our worship service? Um, A.W. Tozer, he said this, after the sacred scriptures, the next best companion for the soul is sacred music. Sometimes our hearts are strangely stubborn and will not soften or grow, uh, grow tender no matter how much praying we do. It is often found that the reading or singing of a good hymn will melt the ice jam and start the inward affections flowing again. We've already seen some some of the significance of music in the book of Revelation, and we see it here again now, there is no doubt about the role that music plays in the life of a church. It's a wonderful thing, and we are a singing church. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean to, to um, boast in us too much, but uh, I've been to churches where uh, the churches, they don't sing. Or it's, a, it's, a con it's more of a concert where the people on stage know the songs and those out in the audience don't know the songs. And you do so well. You, we, you, as a congregation, I, be, I feel we, we do so well learning new songs and singing old songs and singing out and hearing the parts. And we're working on orchestra, orchestra practice today. It was beautiful to hear them practice. And uh, we're excited to have them, them back. The only problem we have is where to put the orchestra. We don't know where we're going to put them. Uh, probably where, right where you're sitting. Uh, so be prepared. We're going to make you mad, but you, you're all right. The, 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 the role that music plays cannot be uh, understated. In the Old Testament, 
in the New Testament, um, in, in the coming kingdom, in the new heaven, in the new earth, we discover God's people are singing. Mankind knows how to sing and loves to sing because music was created by our musical creator, God. Uh, reference already Zechariah. Let me reference Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3.17. In that verse, we were told that God rejoices over his children with singing. God sings about us. We can sing about God. You follow that logic? If God sings over his children, then I believe that his children should want to sing to him and with joy. It makes sense. Jesus also sings. In the upper room, they took communion. In the upper room, they sang a hymn before they left. Jesus sings. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit uh, is said to by Paul in the book of Ephesians, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it will result in us singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to each other. I've just demonstrated for you how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are involved in music. And in fact, if you can base anything and find any rooting in something in a Trinitarian fashion, in other words, if you can find each member of the Trinity involved in something, that gives us a great theological framework. We, we saw that, by the way, just let's chase back to this morning in John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, you have Jesus Christ saying, as God the Father has sent me the Son, so I am sending you, and then he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. In one verse, you have the Trinity, a couple verses. And any time there is a Trinitarian connection, if it's, tri if it's tied to the unity and the cohesion and the order of the Trinity, God the Father, three in one with uh, Jesus and the Son, it, it gives us a great foundation. Music's like that. God the Father, God the, the Son, and God the Spirit create compose and are involved in singing. It should come as no surprise we find God's people singing in the future in heaven. In verse 2, look at verse 2, it says, uh, in the verse that he heard a voice from heaven, heard a voice of many waters, the voice of a great thunder, I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. I think this is where we get the idea that in heaven we all sit around with harps. In fact, I'm reminded, I shouldn't share this with you, um, you remember that old comic, The Far Side, The Far Side comic by, by kind of, somewhat, it was somewhat irreverent, sometimes straight up blasphemous. But I remember this one, and it was this, uh, you're like, oh, this isn't going to be good. Um, I remember this one, it was a split screen, and it, it had, sadly, people going into hell, and the other side had people going into heaven. And it said, welcome to uh, heaven, here is your harp. Welcome to hell, here is your accordion. <laughs> I just always thought that was a, a funny contrast to the instruments. And if you play the accordion, uh, I'm, you're, I'm sure you're a blessing to somebody. <clears throat> so again, on earth, they hear this sound coming from heaven. They hear this beautiful music and they hear a song, verse 3, look at verse 3, they sung as it were a new song before the throne. Um, I know there's a lot of people that just always want to sing the old songs and I love the old songs. We sang some old songs tonight, didn't we Chase? We sang some old hymns, we sang some old hymns. We also sang some new, new songs. We're talking over Christmas, Sophia's home, and we're all together as a family for a few more days. We're like, you want to watch a movie? You want to watch a movie? And I, I, I'll suggest a movie that appears to me to be a family-oriented new movie that is out there on some kind of streaming service we haven't seen. And, and, and she'll say, I don't really like to watch new movies. I like to watch old movies. I like to watch movies I, uh, that kind of make me feel good. And I think, well, at some point, at some point, you have to watch a new movie. Right? I mean, you can't just watch old movies. I, mean, I guess there's, there's probably thousands of old movies. But the idea is that you, you, there's always something new. The Bible says this is a new song. The Psalm 40 says when we accept Christ as Savior, when, when God lifts us from the miry clay and places our feet on the rock, he gives us a new song. In heaven, we've seen this in, in Revelation, they will sing new songs. I don't have no idea what we and the elders and, and the, the beasts are going to stand around. All the other saints are going to stand around. We're going to sing what? 
your favorite Isaac Watts hymn? Your favorite Fanny Crosby? I have no idea. I don't think so. I think there's new songs. I mean, there's newer songs that we'll be singing in heaven. And these evangelists, they hear a song. It is a song that is for them. It is a song that only they can hear and only they can, it is unique to them. No one else can sing this song because no one else can feel this song the way these witnesses can identify with this song. It is their song. They have walked through flame and flood and fire. They have walked through the tribulation as God's witnesses and now they are standing there with the lamb and they're singing. Do you have a song you like? I, um, I have a song, I have a couple songs throughout my life have been especially just meaningful to me. I just love to sing them. I've always loved um, uh, Like a River Glorious. Remember that old song? Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts were fully blessed. I've always loved, I don't, I don't know why. Um, hey, just re- let's just call a timeout. What's your, one of your favorite songs of the faith. Just raise your hand or, or say you want to say something. What's, what's a song that is especially meaningful to you, okay? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. What do you say, Roy? I thirst. I thirst. Yeah, that's a good one. I thirst. All right, Doug. Come unto me. Come unto me. Anybody else in the balcony? All right, Guy. He arose. He arose? Yeah. Up from the grave. That one? Yeah. The love of God. Eve, Eva? In the, in the garden. Who said the love of God? All right, raise your hand next time. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, love of God, yeah. The, the parchment and the quill and the skies. Oh, man, it couldn't, not enough to write the love of God. Mark. And can it be? And, oh, man, and can it be? I heard, an, I, I heard a sacred men's choir singing that on Facebook the other day. It was beautiful, yeah. Okay, anybody over here? Hey, Henry, what do you like? Victory Jesus. You, no, what about any Jewish songs? Come on. Huh? <laughs> Victory in Jesus. Yeah, we all like that one. Good. All right. Frank. It is, oh, that's of course. Yeah. Pam. Mm, I like that one too. Yeah. I remember, I remember um, preaching at, a, at, a valley, at the Valley Rescue Mission in Columbus, Georgia. And they, for some reason, those group, that group of of, of homeless, very needy men. They love to sing. I can still hear, and I'm calling on you, Savior. I, they, they, they added this little part to the chorus. It was so good. I love that song. Pass me not. All right, what else? Anybody else? Yeah. Near the cross. Near the, Pete said near the cross. All right, who else? This is good. Don. That's a, of course, that's a good one too. Yeah. Be over here. <laughs> Put your hand down. <laughs> Last chance. All right, John. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah, I like to march. All right. Um, well, I don't, Karen, what's that song you've been listening to on, that's been on repeat on Spotify? I'm putting you on the spot. It's by Dolly Parton. What is it? I'm just kidding. It isn't by Dolly Parton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Uh, with with Cain and Stephen Curtis Chapman. Boy, you ought to find that song. Write it, write it down. It'll, it'll bless your gizzard. It'll bless you. Um, so there's been, there's been some songs. There's been a song that I, I, I heard and was reminded of. It's a, it's a Christmas song. It involves the angel and Mary and Joseph. It's a beautiful trio song. It's called Hail, Favored One. The family's making fun of me even right now because I just listen. I go around the house like, Hail, Favored One. And I'm singing this song. I'm like, Greg, enough with the song. There's other songs out there. But there's just songs that certain times in our lives just minister to our spirits and they are especially meaningful. They resonate with us. And thank you so much for sharing your special song, because everyone has a, a, a song that is maybe matched with their testimony, something that, that helps you praise the Lord, uh, a song that you turn on, you, you, you know, the, here's what young people call it, they call it their jam, right? It's their jam, it just really gets them thinking about the Lord, and um, it's unique, uh, a unique blessing to them. And so we, we, when we gather and sing, we, I, I, as I mentioned, it might seem a little bit odd sometimes. What are we doing? Just all standing together, singing for 25 minutes? We do not do that out of obligation or because we need time to fill or because the song leader gave us a page number or 
the lyrics on the screen. No, we sing like those in Revelation 14. We sing out of an overflow of a heart of love, of gratitude. That uh, this morning we sang, um, this morning we sang, follow on. What a great choice for January 7th to sing a song about uh, following the Lord and going with our theme. And I didn't tell Chase to do that. He just, he just got with the Lord and chose that song. That's a great uh, New Year's resolution type, let's go do something for the Lord type of song. I, whether the, I go to the valley or the mountaintop, I'm going to follow the Lord. And we sang about how our desire is to know the Lord. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there's no greater thrill. We sang about the come thou fount, come thou king. When you sing words like, oh to grace, how great a debtor. Let it resonate with your testimony, with your Christian life. I, I owe, where would we be without the grace of God? I don't want to go around speaking poetically like that. Oh to grace, how great a debtor. We don't speak that way, but when we sing it, it adds something. It does something to our soul. We sang a new song this morning, Holy Forever. And we sang, I have decided to follow Jesus. With all of us, we have, ought to have, a heart that is overflowing from our unique experience with God, that he's changed us, he's saved us, he's called us, he's blessed us. I know we're all equally saved, we're equally useful in the body of Christ, but it does not mean that there isn't some kind of a truth that will stick with us more than another truth or affect us in a way that it won't affect someone else. Just to stay on this point, let me give you three categories here uh, of maybe songs that we could hear them singing, that we might sing. Letter A is songs about standing. We sing songs often to remind us that we have victory in Jesus. Henry mentioned that one. The, the, um, I heard an old, old story. The victory through the blood. And so just as we see these men standing on Mount Zion, we, ex we can understand and we can experience a little bit of victory, a little bit of heaven in our hearts. We think about being able to stand with Jesus one day. I don't deserve that, do you? And we draw strength to stand up for Jesus as well. Here, here they are, here, here these men are on Mount Zion with the Lamb standing in victory. Hymn histories are the stories behind why hymns were written. Very interesting. Here's the story. Dudley Ting was a well-known speaker in the late 1800s. He had just finished, according to the story, he had just finished uh, preaching to 5,000 at a YMCA event. At the end of preaching to 5,000 young men, 1,000 of those responded and placed their faith in Christ and received the gift of salvation. It was a huge moment of revival. The day after preaching, Dudley Ting went back to his farm for a few hours and decided to go to his barn and hang out and watch some men who were shelling corn. The man got a little too close to the machine. His shirt and his sleeve got caught in the machine. It pulled his entire arm into the grinding gears of the machine threshing the corn and it lacerated his arm beyond repair. He lost so much blood he would be dead in a few hours. His father was there and he reminded Dudley that thousands more people, thousands more men would gather that night to hear him preach. What did he want to be said to them? Through strained lips, Dudley's last words were, tell the people to stand up for Jesus Christ. Tell the men to stand up for Jesus Christ. That night, the assembly hall, that YMC event was packed. This is the 1800s. They were packed expecting to hear Dudley Ting preach again. Instead, they were met with the news and learning of his accident and of his death. Then they were given the words of his final message. A man named George Duffield was there. He heard those words, those last words, and he later sat down and composed a poem. That poem was put to music, and we know that hymn today as Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. For victory unto victory, his army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Indeed, we sing many times songs that remind us of the victory we have in Jesus, by Jesus, through Jesus, because of Jesus, and alongside of Jesus. I wonder also if these men were singing songs about serving. Let her be a songs about serving. I'm almost done. 
tonight. Songs about serving. As I mentioned a moment ago, you'll be happier if you serve. There's an old song that reminds us that there is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus, joy that throbs within my heart. Joy that trumps uh, over pain, fills my soul with heaven's music till I join the glad refrain. Uh, there's another song that says, are you happy in the service of the king? I am happy, oh so happy. Sometimes we have to convince ourselves of that, right? If we're happy to serve the Lord, let's sing about it. I also jotted this category down, songs about surrender. We sing a lot of songs about surrender that like A.W. Tozer said, when sometimes even scripture can't soften our heart, maybe music can. How good it is for us to sing uh, when we have our selfish, stubborn moments to sing songs like, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. There's coming a day when Christ and these evangelists, perhaps us, will do something similar. We will stand with Christ on some mountain of victory. And at that moment, that moment, the Bible says, will be marked by music. According to everything we're being taught in the book of Revelation, there will come a day when we all stand with Christ in victory. There will come a day when we all sing with Christ or sing to Christ. Here's the application. Stand for him now and sing to him now in preparation for that day when all of creation will sing of his glory. And to finish up these last two verses of Chapter 14, point number four is the separation. The separation. We see here listed some distinguishing marks, some distinguishing characteristics of these evangelists that should also be true of us. Three things here, letter A, they are faithful. The Bible says that these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. We're not totally sure if it means they were literally uh, free from sexual activity and never had sexual activity, or if that is simply just a way to describe the purity with which they lived. Most people lean towards just the purity aspect of their lives in general. But they did not defile themselves with women. They did not behave themselves in inappropriate ways regarding women. In the midst, listen to this, in, in the midst of what will be, and you think this is a perverse time, in the midst of what will be in the tribulation, a very perverse time, there were those who were able to stand for God in the midst of a perverse and crooked world. When Satan rules this earth, when Satan has free access, and when God's wrath is being poured out on unbelievers, sexual immorality will reach a level that we have yet to see in this world. But this text proves that it is possible for all of us here that are men and women, but all of us that are here that claim the name of Jesus Christ, it's possible for all of us to live morally in an immoral world. It is possible for us to live purely in an impure world. It's possible for us to live faithful in a defiled world. You can remain sexually pure in what you do, in what you say, in what you see. You can have discipline, to discipline yourself to uh, uh, avoid images and to avoid uh, lingering in those images. You can discipline yourself to live purely. We see letter B, they are, they are followers. They are not only letter A, they are faithful. Letter B, they are followers. I love that description. Verse four, press your mind on upon this. It says, these are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. What a description. What a, what a characteristic. How about that be for our, our theme for this year, 2024, following the Lord. These are they which follow the Lamb. Wherever, wherever Jesus goes, I'm going. Whatever the Lamb does, I'm doing. Wherever the Lamb is, I want to be there. I want to follow the Lamb. I want to serve the Lamb. I want to be surrendered. I want to be holy before the Lamb all the days of my life. I want to follow the Lord. That's what these, these men, they were very close to Jesus Christ. They went where he went. They did what he said to do. They, they, they were obedient. They spoke when they were supposed to speak. There were no areas of their lives where they were not obedient. That's what it looks like to follow the Lord. There were no holdbacks. There were no reservations. There were no hesitations. They left it, nothing in the locker room. There were no holdbacks in their devotion to Jesus Christ. 
And let her see they are faultless. They are faultless. It says, These are the redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God, unto God, to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. They're truthful. They're blameless. They're not perfect. Don't, they're, they're sinners, but they're able to live for God in a fallen world. And there's no guile in their mouth. There's no distortion of truth. And that's important because they're spreading the gospel. There's no distortion of truth. None of that was ever found in these men. These men have always told the truth. They've always been truthful people. The majority of people during the tribulation will be liars. The Antichrist, Satan, father of lies, these, uh, this most dreadful lying will exist in the tribulation, uh, deceit and all those things. But these stood for truth. Again, the word blameless here listed faultless or whatever is not the word, the idea of sinless, but it means there is no valid charge that could be brought against these 144,000 men. Hey, what about that guy? Hey, have you heard about him? No reservation would stick. It, would, it was like, a, it was like a, a, a ball hitting a Teflon pan. It just, it just wouldn't stick. It bounced off. No accusation would stick. In this day and age, when it comes to ministry, pastors, deacons, our lives as Christians, an accusation can ruin your testimony. Just an accusation. They lived their lives free of that. They, leave, they lived their lives free from immorality and deceit and they were blameless during the tribulation. As a result, they enjoyed a close fellowship with Jesus Christ. These three things, if we're faithful, if we follow, if we're faultless, we will enjoy a special fellowship with Jesus Christ one that is strong, one that is healthy, one that is pure, one that is powerful. So let's close. So, so you know what will help our singing? You know, well, you know, here we are. Uh, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. The title of the message, Marching to Zion. You know, you know what will help us as we march to Zion as we're singing? Right living. <laughs> pure living. A life that backs up the songs we're singing. A life that is faithful. A life that is truly surrendered. Sometimes I wonder as I look across and I see people not singing, I wonder how have they lived this week? What has gone wrong in their life? What's up with their testimony? With, 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 are they blameless? How many times am I saying this have we dirtied ourselves with the world and we've served only ourselves and we've fought like cats and dogs in our home and we've come to church and tried to, to use our mouth, the mouth we used all week in a deceitful way, in a cut down way, in a gossipy way. We've, we've now come into the church and we've now trying to use our mouth and we just march into church and we want to sing the old songs of praise. Oh, praise the Lord. And we find it kind of hollow, kind of empty and vain and meaningless. So these qualities that these men had should be in our lives, and if they are, it'll help our singing and our songs of praise. If they are true of us, if these characteristics are not true of us, it will hinder our praise. It will hinder the sincerity of our worship. What I'm saying is this, is that if the songs, the songs of the redeemed are more easily sung when you and I act like the redeemed, when we live for the Lamb all week long, then it's just a celebration once we gather here at 10.15 and 6 o'clock. We sing these songs. Because when we've been living our lives following the Lamb. Well, I hope you can take something away from those applications, seeing really these evangelists meeting the Lamb in victory on Mount Zion, celebrating their protection, their preservation, singing whatever kind of songs of praise they sing, but noting their faithful, pure life. May it motivate us as we march to Zion that we will sing the songs of the redeemed while acting like the redeemed. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed tonight. Let's stand to our feet, please. Maybe tonight you could think about a couple things with me. First is just the, the blessing of music.
as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed and we'll wrap up the service, just the blessing of music and the importance that music plays in your life, not just here in church, but in your car, in your earbuds, in uh, your office, in your home, the, the importance that music plays to, to prepare your hearts and soften our hearts and deflect and reflect our praise to the Lord. Maybe you want to make a commitment to find some good music. Maybe the music you listen to is not helping you do that. You need to find some Christian music. Some music, that, and, and I'll, I'll even go with you in a wide spectrum of genres and a wide variety of styles. I'm not gonna worry about that right now. You find some music that'll direct your hearts to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Help you live for him. Maybe you wanna think about some, some habits, some new habits you can make regarding music in your life. Then, of course, living a life that reflects that music. Let's think about that as we close this evening. Have a song of invitation. Perhaps you can play I Surrender All. Uh, that would be appropriate since we mentioned it in the message. Is your life truly surrendered to the Lord? You're divinely preserved and divinely protected until the Lord calls you home. Let's serve him. Let's sing to him with joy. Let's stand with him in victory. Let's surrender our hearts and our lives and our lips to whatever he asks us to do. So you make some decisions there in your heart or in, in, in your mind or here at the altar while the instruments play a verse or two of I Surrender All.